In this video, we will handle Newton's second law for rotation, putting together the concepts that we mastered in the previous videos on the moment of inertia, right here, and the torques. So from our big board, we'll remind you that if you had constant mass, in linear land, we had the sum of the external forces was equal to the mass times acceleration. That was Newton's second law. In rotation, we've replaced the forces with the sum of the external torques on the object. The mass has been replaced by the rotational analog moment of inertia, and the acceleration with the angular acceleration. Now, both this term and this term here depend upon the axis of rotation. So I have to decide what the axis is so that I can calculate the torques and I can calculate the moment of inertia. This is, was true here, only if the mass was constant, in the same way the moment of inertia has to be constant. Now, the moment of inertia can switch because the axis can switch, or an object can change shape, such as a skater who opens or closes their arms. In this case, this form of Newton's law isn't true, just like if you had an object that was changing mass. You had to use the more complicated varsity form of Newton 2, which was the change in momentum over the change in time. We'll come back and deal with the more complicated version of Newton's second law for rotation in the next module on angular momentum. For now, we'll use the junior varsity term. We've got a rigid body undergoing rotation about an axis, and it has a constant moment of inertia so that we can use this form. The sum of the external torques can't make itself rotate on its own, contrary to certain wily cart uh, coyote cartoons and such where they just begin spinning on their own in space. They can't do that. They have to have an external torque act on them. And that external torque is equal to the object's moment of inertia, I, times its angular acceleration, alpha. Now our method of attack is very straightforward. We need to find I, that is we may have to calculate that using the methods discussed in the previous video. We need to draw a free body diagram and that free body diagram, now some of the stuff we talked about earlier in the semester are going to become important. I had talked about making sure you broke down critical dimensions, and we never had any. Now we will because we'll need dimensions to calculate torques. And we talked about the need, for instance, to put the force where it is applied. That's important because if you change where the force is applied, you change its torque. So we're simply going to do the same thing we did previously but we're going to have to use our free body diagram to calculate torques. We'll use that free body diagram, calculate the torques, and then we'll solve Newton's second law to find the angular acceleration. At least that's usually what's done. If the angular acceleration is constant, then we'll have rotational kinematic equations that can solve for angular velocity. We could use that then to find angular position and so forth. So the big thing here is to find these torques to find alpha. In some problems, this alpha will be connected to other objects moving. For instance, pulleys rotating may be attached to ropes. The ropes attach to blocks. The blocks move. When the blocks move, the pulley rotates. That makes another block move, and so this gets connected to other accelerations. We'll do that in a separate video. So let's see how this does. There's really very little new stuff other than this equation and being careful about what we did previously to solve these problems. If you did well in the chapter on Newton's laws back in 4 and 5, you're going to do well or should do well here. An 8 meter long bar of mass 3 kilograms is attached to a wall at point P with a hinge right here. It's held in place by a cable. There's the cable. The cable is then cut. All right, so they're going to come in here and they cut this cable. When they cut this cable, this thing's going to begin to rotate and they want to know the angular acceleration of the bar first steps is to draw a free body diagram. So isolate the bar. There it is. Like that. The cable's been cut so it's not there but there is weight in the middle of the bar. There's also a hinge. Now we don't know which way the hinge force is going. It could be pointing this away. We could be pointing that away. We don't even know the magnitude or the angle. The best way to handle that is we know any vector can be written into its Cartesian components. 
I'm going to draw one vector. We'll make it a different color here, representing the x component of the force of the pin. I'll call that Px. And then a y component of the pin. This will minimize the trigonometry rather than drawing, as some books do, a vector arrow with an unknown angle, which puts trig, extra trig equations into your thing. I've already broken the vector into its parts. If you want to find the total, which we'll do later on, then you just use the Pythagorean theorem after you find these two things. So they're not really two forces. They're two components of one force, this pin right here. Turns out for this problem, we won't even need them but it's the right way to draw a proper free body diagram. Any other forces? No, the applied force of the pin, the weight, nothing else. And whether you call this applied or normal, that's your own business, but it's got two components here. And that's it. And so we've got all the forces with one F. We need to go ahead and draw an axis. I'll draw an axis right here x and y, we need to put in a positive torque rotation. I will say that the torque is rotating positively, in this case, if it goes that way. Either way is okay. So this positive torque will actually be in the negative z direction. Why did I choose this direction? Because I know that when they cut this, that this bar is going to go that way. And it's going to make it so that things positive in one way are positive in the other. Anything else in this problem? Critical angles. There are no critical angles. Every one of these things are exactly along the axis. Critical dimensions, yes. This is the axis of rotation. I need to know how far away this force is from it. This force is half the bar, which happens to be 4 meters. Or if you prefer, L over 2. So you need to put any critical dimensions that will be needed to calculate the torque. Since that's the axis, I need this one. If there was a force out here, I'd need that dimension too. If I was rotating about this axis, I would need that dimension. Or rotating by this axis, I would need this length, and I would need that length. Any lengths that you need to make your calculations. All right, that's a free body diagram. Some of the torques about point P is equal to the moment of inertia about point P times alpha. I'm going to need the moment of inertia about point P. IP is equal to one-third M L squared. How do I know this? Uh, this is in my table, 8-21 in Gene Colley. If you're using another book, there should be a similar table telling you the moment of inertia for a bar. So you need to find A. Calculating the torques. This force, Px, has no torque because it's got no moment arm. It's applied right at the axis of rotation. This Py produces no torque. It's applied at the axis of rotation. This weight has a moment arm, 4 meters, or L over 2. And it's producing a positive torque in that direction. So the torque is the weight times L over 2, and it's positive. That's equal to 1 third m L squared times the angular acceleration. I can cancel an L on both sides. And I get that alpha is equal to 3 times mg divided by 2 times ml. Notice the mass cancels. 3 halves g over l. 3 halves 9.8 meters per second squared divided by the length. I need to go back up and find what the length of the bar was. 8 meter long bar. 8 meters. Meters cancel. So I punch this in my calculator. 
1.5 times 9.8 divided by 8. 1.84 approximately rad per second squared. Notice the mass fell out of the problem in our pro particular case. Now, would this be a constant acceleration problem? A constant angular? Probably not, because as the bar went down, let's say sometime later, let me draw it up here. As the bar went down sometime later, maybe the bar's down like this, this weight and this distance here would no longer be perpendicular. Didn't do a very good job of drawing my my force. They'd no longer be perpendicular because they're not like that anymore. So there'd be an angle that would be changing, the torque would be changing, and the alpha would probably be changing. So it's probably not a constant acceleration problem. In fact, it won't be if this is all that's involved. Now, if it was rotating about the center mass axis, it would have no desire to rotate at all because the only potential place would be this force here. If it was pinned, then all the forces would be at this point, all the forces would be there. There was no pinning here, no pinning there. There'd be no forces and it would be balanced. It wouldn't decide to rotate or start rotating if it wasn't already. Anyway, this is how you attack a problem like this. In the next video, we'll attack a little bit more complicated problem with the compound pulley where you've got more forces involved and you're also asked to calculate for instance, the axle force right here in the middle. We'll see you at that video.